Thanks. So today, I want to walk through what I like to call the underutilized parts of TensorFlow. Uh, and sort of the buzzy name for that is Beyond Neural Networks, all the other things. Uh, specifically, today, we'll run through, first and foremost, what is TensorFlow, the how, what, and why for if you've never used TensorFlow previously. We'll go through three specific elements that are underutilized that make machine learning substantially easier. The first is what's called the Datasets API for reading in data. The second is using something called TensorFlow estimators or canned estimators. And the third component is something that was new, introduced officially to TensorFlow two weeks ago in the stable release, that is TensorFlow 1.7, which is TensorFlow eager execution mode. Now, this talk is valuable precisely for the reason that it's not valuable. And that is TensorFlow moves incredibly quickly. And as a result of that, new versions come with change-breaking updates. Now, everything that I've done here, uh, I've rewritten, and it works well for the current version of TensorFlow 1.7. All the same, I'll provide you with some of the caveats of where to be on the lookout for where things may be uh, change-breaking for future updates. Now, can I actually get a show of hands uh, if you've ever used TensorFlow previously? That'll help me gauge a bit about the amount of time we spend in each portion. Awesome, so about a third of the room, thank you. So what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is an open source machine learning framework that Google maintains and provides quite a bit of resources for. As noted, it's currently on version 1.7 for the stable release. They claim, or rather, it has been proven to be fast, flexible, and production ready. We'll walk through a bit about what each of those things mean and why that means you should be excited to use it as a part of your stack. And the third is that TensorFlow really reduces the latency between research and production. The rate at which new papers come on archive and uh, are quite literally the new industry leading results seemingly week over week, we want to take advantage of those new methods as fast as we can in the problems that we solve. TensorFlow does a good job of reducing that latency. That is, things that we've seen in research papers can readily be used as a part of in-production models. Uh, a bit of a why TensorFlow. I mean, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, you're like, oh man, just another framework, another thing I gotta learn, why should I invest in trying to pick up TensorFlow when I'm comfortable or totally solving my problems with scikit-learn or, or something else? The first is, Flexibility. So at the top, these are all the languages that you can use, the bindings for TensorFlow. You can deploy any of your graphs to a variety of different uh, computational resources, whether that's a CPU, a GPU, a TPU, Tensor Pro Processing Unit, mobile, or even a Raspberry Pi. And TensorFlow.js actually was just announced at the TensorFlow Developer Summit two weeks ago. So it's incredibly flexible and therefore one that is approachable. The second is community. Now, this is the you and me part. As in, I've highlighted three resources here, but one of the biggest reasons that you may select and use a given uh, machine learning framework is how easy you can get up and running. And the more that you can build off of what someone else has done, the hard parts, the better it's gonna be for your help. So for example, blog.tensorflow.com is a medium blog that any of you in this room are able to contribute to. I just happen to be uh, aware of it early and can be a writer for this given blog. But there's nothing special about me except for the fact that I knew about it earlier. But now my secret is out. Anyone can contribute to the TensorFlow blog, which I recommend taking advantage of. That's for tutorials, resources, etc. The second thing is TensorFlow is, of course, an open source project. The issue here that I've included, uh, TensorFlow issue 1922, is probably my favorite issue ever recorded, and that is if you notice the reflection of the T and the F, it is not what it is supposed to be, as in the refraction of light would not create symmetrical T and Fs. And so someone filed an issue and said, we need to fix this. <laughs> that was not a merged request, unfortunately. The third is, uh, increasing number of tutorials that become available. So, I mean, there's just a screenshot of the notebook that we'll run through at the conclusion of some of the conceptual stuff I do at the top. But in addition to that, 
I'm currently writing quite a bit of uh, curriculum specific to eager execution mode and some of the things we're talking about today. And so keep an eye out for some of that. The third thing is tools. And I separate tools from the community element because when I say tools, I kind of mean the maybe Google developed components that make TensorFlow an incredibly valuable framework. I've called out three of them, but there's truly limitless. The first is something called TensorFlow Hub, which again was introduced two weeks ago. And so uh, TensorFlow Hub makes it really easy to do reproducible bits of machine learning. For example, uh, transfer learning is a great use case where you may want to use the pre canned model or trained model someone else has produced and incorporate it into your own machine learning stack. That's what the uh, thesis behind TensorFlow Hub is. The second is something called TensorBoard. One of the things about TensorFlow is it's for creating computational graphs. Visualizing those graphs and understanding what's going on under the hood can be a little bit challenging. TensorBoard is a way for that to become easy. And the third thing is TensorFlow Serving. TensorFlow Serving takes care of something that I really am not a big fan of, which is handling deployment. When everything's so brittle and you push it off and you're ready to see your model off into the wild, push it out of the nest, and it breaks. TensorFlow Serving helps with that in a big way. And again, these are all uh, Google-backed areas, so they're increasingly getting better, just as much as they're open source themselves. So hopefully, you're like, all right, I get it. It's flexible. Write any, any code in any language to any device. Community. Or what I like to say, you built that, or I built that. Just steal from each other. Get better. And the third thing is the tools, a growing ecosystem of supporting tools. Um, this is an old uh, graphic, actually. And I think stars are a bit of a noisy way to measure a framework. Probably PRs or pull requests are probably better. But generally, uh, the growth of TensorFlow is just straight up and to the right in terms of the number of stars meaning the number of people looking at it. So that's kind of like the, the what and the why, but like how. Like how is it structured? And if you've never seen it before, how would I describe TensorFlow? Frankly, this is the way that I wish someone had explained it to me when I was first picking up the framework. So hopefully you find this to be saving some time for you. TensorFlow is for building computational graphs. All right? Computational graphs. Meaning we define the way that our data is going to run through the graph, and then we run that graph. So for example, sort of the hello world, we're going to define three nodes. Node 1 is just going to be a constant 3.0. Node 2 is a constant 4.0. And node 3 is an operation to add those two nodes together. If we were to visualize what this computational graph looks like, it's like this. 3 and 4 go into an add operation. And by the way, that's roughly what TensorBoard does for you is what I just did there. You can see how much that helps your understanding. The same thing is true for TensorBoard. Now, a graph has been created, but it hasn't been instantiated. So the way that you put data through the graph for an operation to be performed is with a session. So you call a session, and then the output of this session would be seven. I was actually reviewing my deck, and I actually had this be six for a long time. So that was a good last minute look of simple addition. Now, I added a giant asterisk here, OK? I said we want to define how our data flows with the graph and then call that graph, as in two discrete steps. That giant asterisk is really important. As described, as of 1.7, TensorFlow has what's called eager execution mode, which does imperative programming such that when you define an operation, it runs in time just in time, and produces the output. We'll talk a bit more about what that looks like in practice, but the point here is that uh, th I suspect this slide will not age well for the ways that we come to know TensorFlow. Nonetheless, we'll talk about what that means for the future. Now, the other part of TensorFlow that's important to note is it's for doing those computational graphs on tensors. And tensors are maybe a pejorative definition, are something like generalized matrices, where we also record the system that defines how those numbers in the matrices operate. They're really common in physics. For example, like fluid dynamics, you're able to say one part of the system, how is the rest of the, say, resistance and friction in that system operating? And so if you've been following along, we have a little bit of a quiz here, all right? Wait a second. Wait a second. So I'm going to create some nodes. I'm going to create one node called tensor. And tensor is a constant that says useful math structure. I'm going to create another node called flow. <laughs> 
And flow is called graph for data flow. I'm going to create something called result, which is going to add tensor and flow together. So this is what our graph looks like. So you're telling me that if we were to take tensors, which are data structures for more or less linear algebra, and define flow, then we would get TensorFlow. <laughs> All right, so what are you missing out on? Now that you're like, great, that's, that's pretty cool. This guy's too excited about TensorFlow. Well, that's great. What are you missing out on? Now, to be specific, quite a bit. Um, but to be specific for today's talk, there's, I want to take like a 30,000 foot view of what are the specific elements we're going to talk about today. Generally, machine learning problems, right, they follow this flow. We've got to define the problem, identify the data for that problem, um, be sure we have clear success metrics up front, obtain and clean our data, build a model, deploy that model. Loosely the flow we're following. Today, we're only going to address elements that are applicable really to these two middle steps, and predominantly that third step, uh, reading in data and then also building a model. So reading in data, reading in data. TensorFlow dataset API, the why, the why. So input data is the lifeblood of machine learning. It's what allows all of our models to have informed ways of going about solving problems. Uh, and modern accelerators need faster input pipelines. We think about some of the newest uh, technology, like NVIDIA's Volta or even cloud TPUs, and if we have a limiting reactant, which is the rate at which our data can get to our models, or even perhaps the size of the data not fitting in memory, we need some different alternatives. Uh, and so here's a nice little pipeline GIF, and the data is just rushing through it. The data is the surfer in this visual. So there's a one million data points question. How can we move data through a system faster? We need a paradigm shift. We need a paradigm shift. Specifically, we need to think about object-oriented programming versus functional programming, okay? Object-oriented programming is what we're most used to in Python. We create objects, which contain data in the form of fields, attributes, right? And we work with that data using methods. An example from pandas, df.columns is an attribute. What are the names of our columns? df.head shows us the first x number of rows where we can pass some number. It's a method. Now, functional programming treats computation as the evaluation of, well, mathematical functions. And that means that when the data is in this pipeline or in this functional world, it avoids uh, changing state and it's no longer mutable. So what do I mean by that? I mean, think about any given function. For example, our function of add one, it takes a number and then it adds one to that number. This number's data type is not going to be changed throughout this function and it's just going to be defining the way data flows through. So, so, we need to treat our input data as a functional pipeline. And when I wrote that, I was like, everyone's gonna be like, all right, cool, great buzzwords, Joseph. So, I want us to do a little thought experiment. A little thought experiment. Imagine that's the beginning of the summer, and you have a swimming pool, but it's empty. And you need to fill that swimming pool, okay? You need to fill that swimming pool. Now, you have two options. Option one is you get a five gallon bucket, and you go to your water source, you load up the five gallon bucket, you walk back, you dump it in your swimming pool. You do that over and over again. Option two, you make a pipeline that connects your water source to the pool. Which do you prefer? And if this were a class with my students, I'd make you all hold up fingers for one or two, but you all are like, we were at a party last night, we just wanna listen to you to be excited about computational graphs. I don't blame you. So let's talk about the trade-offs before saying our answer. Option one, our five-gallon bucket. So, of course, it requires you to make multiple trips. But along those trips, imagine you could test, like, I don't know, the salinity or the chemical composure of your data before you dump it into your swimming pool. In other words, you could, like, add some level of, of, of chlorine to the water along the way. The pipeline requires a lot of upfront investment in infrastructure. Uh, you aren't able to check the water along the way, but once it's built, you just turn on the water and it gets into the swimming pool. Now, these are my parallels for object-oriented and functional programming. So, if we're having a pool party, we wanna get the water in there as soon as we can, we're gonna do some functional programming to define a pipeline that connects the source to where we want the data to go. 
So in this water analogy, we're going to make a splash. We're going to make a splash and have the data flow as water from the source into our models. And apologies, when I make a bad joke, you have to react, otherwise we can't keep going. <laughs> it's a social contract of the speaker audience relationship. So functional programming, we're gonna make pipelines. A functional pipeline allows us to create a single data set out of many large data sets or even infinite. For example, imagine that your computer has eight gigabytes of RAM. You have a data set of 100 gigabytes, of images or something. If you actually had that data set in smaller disparate pieces, a functional pi pipeline would allow you to take that data set in smaller pieces, update the gradients of your model, and then yield it out of memory over and over again. Um, so key points. This requires declaring a pipeline in the first place. It requires a single data type, a list in this case, is used throughout. And it can be tricky to debug. For the same reason that like, you're making your pipeline for your, filling up your swimming pool, it's kind of tough to tell like, what's going on with the water inside there. So it's a little bit trickier to debug. But functional programming to the rescue. Functional programming allows us to just define our pipeline and then feed it as much data as quickly and as fast as we want. So now that you're sold that functional programming is a great way to accelerate our machine learning process, how do we use tf.data? Well, there's the data set interface. We have data sources and functional transformations. Recall that I said functional programming is all about defining functions and chaining those functions together which means we need to create a data set, create a data set object, actually, from tensor objects. Data set from tensors, our features and our labels. Secondly, we could also separately create a data set from tensor slices if we wanted, if we didn't want the full tensors at that point. We could also read in text from a bunch of different file names, like my example of you have 100 gigabytes split up into various different files and create a data set that is the agglomeration of all those smaller components. You can also create a data set from another data set. So you could have a map operation where you wanna do a specific type of decoding or encoding along the way. Or you wanna do a repeat where you have some number of training sessions. Either are great. But once you have your given data set that you want to work with, Oh, for example, batches, if you want to do training in a consistent number of uh, batches of data points. So for example, every single time you use these 30 consecutive data points, the next 30 consecutive data points. So now that you have your data set object, um, and this is a little bit meta, because you're like, why are you saying object if you told me this is functional? You're creating an object that defines the pipeline. Okay, you're creating an object that defines the pipeline. Once you have your given way of constructing your data set, there's many ways to do it. You then can create a data set. For example, read records from a list of files, like TF record data set, string values into tensors using map, shuffling, repeating, batching. All right there for you. The iterator interface. Once we have a pipeline, we want to use each of those smaller tensor, tensors that are now uh, in our pipeline to iterate through them. So we need an iterator object where we're going to iterate through the data set that we just created. So create an iterator from a data set. Uh, and there's different types of iterators you can make. You can make a one-shot iterator that's going to run through your entire data set once. So it's like one-shot training. That's probably what we're most used to. Or you can make something a little bit more complex, an initializable iterator where you want to define a specific way by which you're going to iterate through each of the portions of your data set. Now, um, you may need to, so, so given, given, that, given that we have this data set pipeline, you then need to call a session by which you're going to turn the water on, okay? So we have the ability to create our data set, we have the ability to iterate how exactly the water is going to be coming through, we then turn the water on with a session. The last thing I wanted to note uh, about iterators, or second to last thing, is you may want to do this in a while loop or any type of loop, where you're gonna iterate through each given portion, each batch, for example, is what we'll do in the, in the, in the code example. Now, here's what it's gonna look like all together. We have data set equals from our previous thing, whether that's from a bunch of files or from uh, a bunch of tensors. 
we can make a one-shot iterator that initializes itself for first use. We then have our images and our labels, and our iterator then gets next and goes through. That's like saying the water's flowing, if you will. We then have our training, and we can loop through and do this all the way until all data has been consumed. We've tapped the world out of water, so to speak. So it's relatively intuitive. It's a little weird at first, but once you think about it like, oh, I need to define the elements of this pipeline and then run through the pipeline and call it and iterate and update my model, it's exactly what you expect. So you'd put this all into a function. We then would use something like an estimator where we're training our model, and this is what we're going to do in today's code. And with that estimator, you're going to train. Lastly, you could get a little bit even fancier, if you like, where you initialize for each time you're training through, you could yield something or uh, get a status check of how things are looking. A really nice thing is uh, once you get to the end of all of the water, so in this example, you've tapped through the city's water supply, you'll get an out of range error. And that just means that you've finished training. Now, the summary of tf.data. We're creating a functional pipeline and then iterating through that pipeline we've created. That requires creating a data set which represents the input pipeline using functional transformations, and then an iterator which provides sequential access to the elements of our data set pipeline. Cool. Building models. Building models. So this talk is called Beyond Neural Networks. So the TensorFlow is exceptional as a framework for neural networks. Moreover, it has a dramatically underutilized uh, number of components that make model building easier. And I want to talk about those. So for example, uh, as stated, TensorFlow makes model building easy. And canned estimators, which is what we're going to talk about, are reproducible models that make it as easy as really like scikit-learn models, where it's ridiculous, right? We just say like random forest equals RF. RF.fit, RF.predict. Machine learning engineer, where's my paycheck, right? <laughs> same thing, same thing. So why don't we have the same ease of use in TensorFlow? We do. You just haven't been using it. This is what model estimator, or what canned estimators are. Faster iteration, encoded best practices, because you already have some given estimator that's going to operate in a specific manner. Built-in scalability, because it's still going to be a graph that you can deploy to any given computational unit. And better deployment, because you can use TensorFlow serving. So if I'm thinking about this, and I'm like, OK, so I could use like maybe a scikit-learn scikit tree, uh, decision tree, or something from TensorFlow decision tree. If you use the estimator from TensorFlow, you get all these built-in benefits that we were describing of the easier deployment, the ease with which you can put this on any given computational unit. So what does this look like? Um, I'm very visual. So what does this look like in terms of our stack? When you're really close to the metal, so to speak, you have your given computational area where you're running it, whether it's your CPU or your GPU. You then have your TensorFlow distributed execution engine. On top of that, you have whatever front end you're using. I've been talking about using a Python front end, but remember I said there's a bunch of other things you can use. On top of the Python front end, there's layers where we build models. On top of layers, we have different ways to create and interact with layers. That's where Keras and estimators come in. Keras makes it easier to interact with TensorFlow because you can just do things like model.add sequential. And then on top of this, we have canned estimators. And so we're getting further and further from memory, higher and higher level, with less specificity, like less control, but easier use and easier reproducibility. So we have models in a box. Models in a box. So this is us canning an estimator, compressing it. Probably this is what it looks like when we put things into deployment. All right. So using TF Estimator, we're like, that's great. How do I use this one? I promise it's easier than the last one. The last one doesn't, re it doesn't require a functional programmatic paradigm shift. First and foremost, TensorFlow 1.7 has the following canned estimators already available to, for you. There is uh, Deep Neural Network Classifier, Deep Neural Network Regressor, Linear Classifier, Linear Regressor. Okay, 
Okay, you want more than that. In contrib, which means likely in 1.9 or 2.0 TensorFlow, there's a bunch of other models too. For example, there's decision trees, gradient boosted trees, random forest, k nearest neighbors, RNNs, and more. And these are hidden in the contrib portion of TensorFlow, should you be familiar. And so, and last as, an always, as another note, you can always build your own canned estimator. I'm not gonna talk about that in this talk, but I'm happy to point you to resources should you want to, for your team, someone creates a really awesome model. Uh, we'll say Gary. Gary creates an awesome model, and you want anyone to be able to use Gary's model. So Gary.fit, Gary.predict, you sure can. Now, what does this look like in code? Frankly, pretty simplistic. We set up a model. We have our features and our inputs. And in this given example, I've included um, kind of a tricky encoding with our zip code, which I'll talk about here in a second. But notice we have our regressor, which is just called linear regressor. And this looks very much like scikit-learn, if you're familiar. We fit and we evaluate. This is it. This is it. You now can put TensorFlow on your resume. Go ahead and do this. TensorFlow expert. 20 minutes of experience. So I said that we have some funny features. We have some uh, numeric features, and then we also have zip code, which is a sparse feature, uh, which we're gonna encode in this manner. Next thing, imagine you wanna do a deep neural network regressor. Look how much code changed, okay? Look how much code changes. Uh, look how much code changes. <laughs> just wanna get your attention. We just flip in a different type of estimator. We need to add specific to this estimator the number of hidden units we want, given we're now using a neural network. And the other small thing is um, this neural network doesn't work so well with sparse features, and so we're encoding zip code a little bit differently, too. We have an embedding column. Now, the estimator summary. Create complex, auto-scaling, reproducible models simply. Sort of like the TF estimator's promise. Um, we use tf.estimator. Oh, that's a little bit of a typo. Well, actually, no, that wasn't a typo. I was thinking. I was thinking. And the capital estimator is the name of the estimator you want to use. So tf.estimator dot name of estimator you want to use. So DNN regressor. And I included the documentation for all the other ones that are soon going to become available. Um, all right. So estimators, that's cool. I like those. I like those. What else do you got for me? I for you, easier model debugging. Easier model debugging. So graphs are great, right? Until they are not. Graphs are great. What are they great for? What are they great for? And again, if this were one of my classes, I'd make you tell me, be sure that you were studying for the midterm. But instead, I'll tell you. But this is on the final. Parallelism. A system can easily identify what to parallelize. It can identify which operations uh, in other words, could be run concurrently. Secondly, distributed execution. There's explicit edges to our nodes, which allows for partitioned computing across different devices. They're also great for compilation. For example, uh, accelerated linear algebra is a faster uh, way to fuse operations together. And TensorFlow is built on top of this. Um, really nice thing is we don't actually much need to interact with that if we're staying in high level land. The TensorFlow, like the Python bindings in higher level from that diagram that I showed, you don't have to much worry about that portion. Portability. Building a single language, run in another because you can export the underlying graph and do whatever you like with it. Then why would you ever want to move away from graphs? Graphs are great until they are not. Graphs are not great. First, delayed error reporting. Imagine that you make a graph that has a problem, right? There's some bug. You don't know about that problem until you call for your session. So you don't know that there's a leak in your pipe until water's flowing through it. Second, unintuitive control flow, especially if you're new to TensorFlow. It's very unintuitive from a Python perspective. And the third thing related, unfamiliar data structure. Um, Non-immutable data types can be challenging just as much as um, non-native Python data types. Okay, so what are we gonna do about that? Oh yeah, this is the breakup slide. Uh, it's not you, it's me. 
I'm the one that's bad at graphs, not you, TensorFlow. It's all good. So TensorFlow eager execution mode is intuitive. Uh, as in, TensorFlow introduced eager execution to make the model building experience more user friendly. That gives us really just the foil of the previous drawbacks I noted. One, Python debugger tools. Two, immediate error reporting. Three, easy control flow. And four, Python data structures. If you ever used PyTorch, this is how PyTorch inter uh, works uh, when you first start using it. And it feels much more intuitive and Pythonic. Um, if I wanted to provide a comment about why I think this is happening, I suspect that adoption of PyTorch has increased for beginners for that exact reason. And TensorFlow is a little bit nervous about that and instead uh, introducing this. But frankly, it's, it's better overall for um, these reasons and, and white box reasons to see what's going on. So let's see. For example, uh, like our boilerplate code, whenever we do TensorFlow stuff, we need to first create our data types, our nodes, the nodes that are going to hold the data, whether that's a variable, a constant, a placeholder, whatever it is. Uh, in this case, we're going to do matmol, so matrix multiplication. Uh, we could print out uh, what that would return, and that's what it would return there in that comment. Remember, describe the graph, then run the graph. So the top half of this is describing the graph, the bottom half of with tf.session running the graph. In this case, get a matrix multiplication, get four. That's our boilerplate code when we're in graph land. Eager execution land just runs. It runs when you actually call for an operation. So it compiles and runs, and it looks like this. So this becomes this. Hello. Instant errors. If there's an error in our graph, we're immediately going to know. We're immediately going to know. Third, Python control flow. So here's an overly complex function. <laughs> On the right is what it prints out at each given time. Uh, if you're sort of like struggling with what this really means, like this graph thing, Basically, think about it like this. If you made a for loop and you couldn't see what's happening at each time you run that for loop, that's how like TensorFlow is by default. But when we introduce TensorFlow eager execution, that makes it called what we say imperative programming, and we're able to see the outputs at each given moment. So that becomes a question. If you're familiar with TensorFlow graphs, you might be wondering what happens to gradients. <laughs> what is going on with our gradients? This solution is. I kind of love it. It's super hacky, but it works really well. So what happens is, with eager execution, your operations are recorded to like a tape, like a, like a videotape that you're going to play back later. Um, I'm a big hockey guy, so it's like we're recording the, the, my past as a, as a hockey player. I'm going to see how bad I was. And then the tape is played back to compute the gradients at each time. What does that look like in code? Let's say that we had just a simple function that we're squaring things. We then See the TFE, TensorFlow eager, dot gradient functions square. And then we could print square for each of these and get the portions that we're at with our gradient. That also, um, we could do this for the partial derivative of the prior operation and print out that partial derivative as well. So the gradients are being calculated. So how do you use TensorFlow eager execution? How do you use TensorFlow eager execution? This is it. <laughs> Import tensorflow.contrib.eager as TFE. And in fact, you don't need to contrib anymore. Um, that line of code is a little bit outdated as of two weeks ago. You'll have to excuse me. Uh, instead, you can just say uh, tensorflow.eager as TFE. And then TFE.enable underscore eager underscore execution. And then it's enabled. And everything runs imperatively from that point forward. You can't go back. Once you enable eager execution, you have to start like a different kernel to go back to your computational graphs. So that's a pretty key note. Now, uh, the same API for model building looks very, 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 very similar. In fact, this is the exact same way you would build a model where we create our layers. We have some optimizer function like stochastic gradient descent, define our learning rate. This looks exactly the same. It's just in graph land, this has not been called yet. In eager execution land, it's being called. We define a loss function, of course, whether that's reducing the mean squared error between the predictions and the model, or the real and the model predictions. And we compute and apply our gradients. 
So, for example, remember last time we said square was our gradient? In this case, we're going to use a real optimizer. We're going to apply gradients for our gradient function for each of our next batches. To do this, well, actually, that's, that's, that's how we do it. So <laughs> to do this, we declare our gradient uh, with our given loss. We then call it throughout each of our next batches. And this is what's creating that tape at each given moment. Each of these gradients are being recorded and updated back for our model. So what should I do? Joseph, you're telling me a very complicated story. You have eager execution. You have estimators. You have graphs. What should you do? Here's my recommended workflow. All right, my recommended workflow. I recommend, if you're new to TensorFlow, or even if not, that you enable eager execution for the purposes of debugging. Um, that's particularly true if you're new to TensorFlow. Secondly, you could checkpoint your code. And by that, I mean train eagerly. So train in an eager manner. But then save and export your models um, and load to graph, or vice versa. So when I said that once you go eager, you can't go back, I don't mean like forever. I don't mean like your computer is now stuck in TensorFlow eager execution land and you have to just blow it up and go get a new computer. Instead, what I just mean is that current kernel. That current kernel is thinking eagerly. Which means that in one kernel, you could have eager execution, have a really good model that you like quite a bit, export the model, and then in a separate kernel, open up a graph operation, and then you reap all the benefits of graphical computation. Things will be paralyzed, it'll be easy to, de to deploy. And by that I mean step three, selectively compile portions of your computation into graphs and execute. Future versions of TensorFlow, if you take a look at Contrib and what's happening in some of the talks at the Dev Summit, clearly what's going to happen is this, this process, this step-by-step, -step, which is like a recommended workflow, I think is going to be encoded into TensorFlow. It's going to assume that you are doing things eagerly um, and then separately that you want to checkpoint your code throughout. Um, all right, so I have, a, I have a binder notebook here where in this binder notebook we're going to do estimators, an estimators demonstration, because I think that's like the, the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak. If you've never seen TensorFlow before or you have seen TensorFlow before, you're probably not using canned estimators as effectively as you could. And so go here, and it'll open up the binder link. Now I need to figure out how to get my screen over there. Okay. Oh, nice. Looks good. OK. Zoom in a little bit. So what are we, what are we doing in this portion? What are we doing in this portion? Uh, I promised you really three, three things, three introductory concepts. You have code snippets for each. Those code snippets 100% work for each of those things. In this specific code demonstration, I'm only focusing on estimators. We're only focusing on building and saving an estimator. There is a reason for that. Estimators um, were created in the TensorFlow paradigm before eager execution was thought to be a thing. So in fact, right now, est estimators and eager execution don't play nicely together. Uh, yeah. Now, what are we doing? So in this case, we're doing a pretty um, straightforward example with MNIST, and notice that all the documentation at the top here I've provided, we're going to use our input functions and use a couple of different estimators. Get some NumPy, get TensorFlow, get those into the kernel. Good. All right. I always get nervous with binder irrationally. I know it's going to work, but I get nervous. So we'll use Keras, which is included with TensorFlow, to import the data. So we're getting MNIST, right, our 10 digits, 1 to 9 our handwritten digits. We're going to make x train be a float, x test be a float, y train as type, integer, y test, also an integer. Because remember, we're predicting a single number. So it's a whole number, a counting number. Uh, we then want to normalize the color values from 0 to 1. So we're going to divide each of them by 255. And then I'm going to print out the number of all right, so it's downloading the data. Great. Number of our training examples and our testing samples. OK, now this input function is not leveraging the datasets API. It is leveraging using NumPy as an input function. 
Uh, in a future, a future demo that I'm happy to point you to, I have um, a couple of examples of the data sets API. Now, in this case, I'm just going to say the train input. We are using our estimator from NumPy input function. X is X train, Y is Y train. We're going to be able to repeat for as long as we want. In other words, we're going to set how many training sessions we have later. So right now, we just set it to none, uh, which means it, it would go infinitely unless we define some number of steps for training. And we're also going to say, true, do shuffle our, our observations. Our test data, very similarly. But we don't want to shuffle the test data. Remember, we want the answers to be right there with the questions. We don't want to shuffle around the answers to a different place than the questions we're asking. And we're also only going to loop through once, because we only need to see if we were right on a single time. So we only need to loop through once. Now, with our feature spec, I'm defining our shape. We'll use that feature spec in our estimator. So the first one we're going to use is a linear classifier, so just a logistic regression. We have 10 classes, remember our 10 digits. And we can also export our model directory to some uh, place local to our machine. In this case, graphs, canned, linear. We get the input of the uh, information of this specific class. And then now here, here is the easy training that I promised you. Easy training. So estimator.train, our train input, and we set steps for 1,000, meaning we're not setting the number of times we're running through the data set, we're updating our gradients 1,000 times for our steps. So we train, and notice, notice how well uh, this logs. It logs much like Keras does, where you have each of our accuracy, and it should be getting down to evaluate, we print out our evaluation. There we go. There we go. Yep, approximately, you'll have approximately 90%. Depends on where your um, gradient's randomly instantiated, how they trained for your given machine. But they'll be around 90% for a linear classifier. Now, if you wanted to print out individual predictions, we could just create a little loop here where how many things we want to print, we're going to say max to print. We're going to have our predictions where, notice, this is the key thing about estimators. Predictions equals estimator.predict. And you can update, flip in and out, whatever estimator is. Wherever you instantiated estimator, this will follow. We then have our class ID. So we're going to print out the specific class ID. We're going to print out what was predicted. And we're going to say break once we've reached our max to print. In other words, we're going to print out five examples. So for example zero, we predicted that the handwritten digit was a seven. Or excuse me, the true, the true handwritten digit is a seven we predicted it was indeed seven. And we have that for each of these first five inputs. Now say we want to use a fully connected deep neural network instead. Well, we just say a new estimator, but this time the estimator we're going to use is a deep neural network classifier. We need to specify some number of hidden units, right, because we're not in linear classifier land anymore. Uh, arbitrarily, two layers, 10 classes, and we're going to uh, export to uh, our, our given local directory with our graphs. Done. That estimator has now been instantiated. The same exact code from above can be repurposed to train. This time I'm going to use 2,000 steps. And here we see our loss decreasing. It's looking good. It's looking good. Evaluate it similarly, and we get these verbose prints. And yes, indeed, we get around a 97% accuracy. Of course, it's an easy data set, but generally, the point here is not necessarily the data sets, but how easily you could flip these things in and out. As a last concluding note, if you want to use TensorBoard, you would run this in your terminal, and it would create a local server and open up TensorBoard in your browser. Now, if you want examples, clearly, clearly we are time constrained, and there's only so many things I can do. <laughs> 
If you want examples of eager execution mode in the Datasets API as well, um, I have linked this resource in the README, but I'm also just going to show you that the current example uh, in the TensorFlow docs, they very quietly changed it such that the introduction to TensorFlow Notebook is no longer the hello world that does a uh, linear classifier, uh, or a linear regression, in fact, where you create a graph, and if you've seen that. Now, instead, in fact, it's a collab notebook, which is like a Jupyter notebook with Google Compute resources that you run in your browser. And it actually runs through an example of using eager execution uh, with the datasets API on the Iris dataset. And so let me just fast forward to the datasets portion that I want to see, or I want to show. We have a way to parse each of our tensors, and then we call that when we define where we're calling our training data set, our steps, um, our mapping. Our mapping is how we are parsing each of our tensors. Our batch size, our buffer size for our random shuffle. And then this, in fact, creates a successful data set object, which we then can use to iterate through. So I encourage you to run through this which is, as you can tell, incredibly well documented if you uh, seek examples beyond this. Now, let me see if I can get the mouse back. All right, now, you can find me all over the web. I'm Joseph of Iowa, from Iowa, and I identify with that identity very strongly. Tom is also from Des Moines, Iowa, and I swear we didn't know that when he introduced me, uh, or even when I came to this conference. It's very exciting. Um, I'm gonna give a couple of thanks. The first is to General Assembly, my employer that allowed me to come here. Uh, General Assembly is a 21st century education boot camp for various programs. Data science, web development, UX design. And at General Assembly, I have the privilege of both writing curriculum, leading classes, they let me toy around with their data to a high degree, and increasingly, GA does both consumer-side training and enterprise-side training. So we've seen a huge growth of organizations saying, we have these, this population of developers, and instead of, for example, um, going out and recruiting for a whole new skill set, we're going to retrain. And it's actually a really exciting process. Anacondacon, of course, uh, for hosting us. Great party. You all uh, are included, of course, in coming to that. And lastly, Josh Gordon. He's a developer advocate on the TensorFlow team from whose notes I was able to draw. I have two minutes. Um, I'm happy, to, of course, to do this wide Q&A, but I equally welcome the opportunity to ask me questions afterwards. The README for this GitHub repository includes a lot of other resources, and so please do check that out. But if we have a couple of formal questions, I defer to Tom. All right, thanks. Uh, let's give a round of applause.